Since my last kitchen vid, the refurb has been mysteriously quiet and a lot of you have been asking what's going on. I owe you an update and so here it is. In today's video, I'm going to be talking you through the fun and games I've had, demolishing chimneys, replacing the entire floor structure of my daughter's bedroom, or the kitchen ceiling I should say. And finally, in the downtime, I've had some really good opportunities to think quite carefully about how I'm going to do things like the internal wall insulation. All that's coming up in today's vid. So a quick recap as to why I'm standing in this building site. We've had two architects in the past. The first was a complete charlatan, came up with this wacky scheme which never got through planning. And the second was pretty decent, but what he came up with for effectively two rooms, one above the other, was far too expensive for us. And I ended up falling out with and a half thousand quid to sit in our garden watching bats flying around when we would have been increasing rather than decreasing that roof space anyway. So we thought we'd abandon the architects this time round and just reconfigure the space and would decide where to put the new kitchen once the wall had been removed, by which point we could better get an idea of the space and how best to use it. At the same time we'd rip up the floor to install underfloor heating with most of the downstairs covered by underfloor heating instead of microbore supplied radiators, we'd be transforming the house with a massive underfloor radiator and more importantly future proofing it for when we're all forced to install heat pumps. Which by the way I think is ridiculously impractical given 8 million houses in this country still have uninsulated solid walls like mine and only 15% of the UK's housing stock was built after 1995 with energy saving in mind. But with the wall taken out it wasn't as easy as we had thought trying to shoehorn a kitchen eating and TV area into a t-shirt. We asked you lot what you'd do and the poll across YouTube and Instagram was split completely down the middle with 81 saying we should go option 1 and 81 with option 2. A load of you suggested I get feng shui expert Cliff involved. By this point we'd made the space work by shifting the TV seating area into the old lounge and Cliff agreed that by doing this we would have a pretty decent kitchen and dining space. The only issue being the kitchen island my wife wanted would get in the way of the main access into the rest of the house. But by now I was starting to think I was going to need an architect, after all. Why? Because firstly we'd now decided we wanted to fill in this corner, to add a utility room. You can't do it under permitted development as this is on the front elevation of the property. Loads of friends said we should but that's risky and hey, I'm doing vids on this stuff so need to do it properly. Secondly, a couple of things were worrying me. The new joist floor we'd installed with a 4.3 metre span just looked far too light and it was concerning me that the steels my builder had ordered to go above the bifolds didn't have the detailing to allow for a continuous course of bricks hiding the steel in the front skin. So on the recommendations of my company to make John, I've instructed a local architect with an in-house structural engineer, which is handy because the guy who specified this deal has disappeared again. And this is where the projects hit a problem. The architect immediately pointed out we could flip the design and have the utility on the other side of the kitchen. And by removing those load-bearing walls, we can have the kitchen on the south side of the cottage with an island that doesn't interrupt access to the rest of the house. He agreed with me this roof structure was inadequate, more on that in a minute, put me in touch with a company that can specify all the detailing of the steels as well as the new steels that are going to go in that area where the load bearing walls are being taken out. So we submitted planning a week or so ago and I'm going to have to wait eight weeks at least for the decision to come through. Unfortunately we live in an area with a shocking planning authority so I keep my fingers crossed. Hopefully this scheme is so minor it'll go through without too many problems. Now I'm probably going to get criticism for not thinking about all this before I started and in fact somebody this week said if you fail to plan you plan to fail. Fair enough but we never planned to do anything other than that simple knock through and it was only when we were stood in this space that all these problems started to come into light. And the irony is I spent all my time videoing and editing that I probably didn't devote enough time at the start of this project to working out all the issues that might crop up. But as this is the first time I've done a building project of this scale, chances are I wouldn't have known about half of them like those steel specification issues anyway. But you're probably thinking, how is he coping all that time out of his kitchen? I had a cunning plan to deal with that. I've plumbed in every single appliance from the kitchen, tumble dryer, oven, dishwasher and washing machine, together with state-of-the-art extraction in our old porch. And then in our hallway, We've got Micro Kitchen, which has got our old fridge, my MFT worktop, an improvised shelving system, and sort of everything we need. But there is a downside to this because every time I make a modification to this kitchen, my wife gets more and more worried that I'm delaying moving back into the old space. 
Time for a quick update on the underfloor heating. Now after my underfloor heating video, I think that was number two in the series, I had a message from Jim at eTuppling to say he was concerned about the pipe spacing, the 200 mil pipe spacing of the system that had been designed for me by Polypipe, who up until that point were going to be specifying and supplying my underfloor heating. Cut a long story short, I had a couple of conversations with Jim, he kindly came to visit me, and I now have a far superior system designed with 150 mil pipe centers and a five degree Celsius delta T, meaning the return to the boiler will be 30 degrees Celsius and the flow temperature should never go over 40. Two reasons why underfloor heating systems are so fantastic. Firstly, you're creating that massive radiator under the floor. And secondly, your typical radiators around the house operate at what, 65-ish? We're talking about a 30 to 40 degree range. You're relieving all that pressure off your boiler and that's where you can start to think about changing your boiler for say a hot water priority system or dare I say it in the future one of these heat pumps. Also Jim's design now has all the balance settings which I'm told is often a problem for the installers installing these systems not having all the information they need to set the system up properly. Now I'll cover all this in a future video but the reason it's important today is that I need to set the manifolds on this wall in the lounge next to the kitchen where I'm intending to build a bespoke bookcase to house the manifolds but also the TV and the audio. So I thought whilst I was waiting for planning I demolished the chimney. My builders didn't want to touch this as they thought it continued upstairs but I knew from refurbishing the bathroom a few years ago that it didn't so I attacked it with my mains SDS drill to remove the half that had been concreted into the joist, as was so often done in Victorian properties. I then used my 18 volt SDS to remove the bricks, which wasn't a particularly difficult job to do because the mortar between the bricks was pretty crumbly. But the issue I had is that from a certain height up, the chimney had been filled with lots of waste in the past. It was a pain to remove this and created so much dust around the kitchen. But I did discover some pretty cool things like these cigarette packets and also a few old newspapers including this one from 1956 when Marilyn Monroe was still alive. So the chimney's now gone, I'll be punching through somewhere down there, and I also need to remove this little cupboard that I built about 10 years ago. With a new structural engineer on board, it was time to investigate that floor. I just didn't like the look of it. It failed the bounce test when I got my daughter to jump up and down upstairs, and I had eight weighty packs of this engineered oak to install. And sure enough, he ran some tests and his findings, which I repeated in this post on my community page, were that the joist failed in bending stress and deflection, with an estimated deflection of 40 millimeters with those single 150 mil joists. Two joists bolted together reduced the deflection to 21, but three brought it down to 14.2, just below the maximum allowed 16.4. He also recommended bolting them together every 400 millimeters with M12 bolts and timber connectors and one row of noggins mid-span to firm it up. 500 quid later when you include the extra 48 timber connectors I forgot to order and I could start with the strengthening works. After removing all those noggins that I'd put in, first up I had to increase the slots in the inside brick skin. Remember my wall only has two courses of bricks to make room for the two extra joists that would be sistering up either side of the existing. A lot of you will say I should instead be bolting joist hangers to the wall, but I suppose something like this would have done the job if I could have got a decent fixing into the crumbling masonry of my walls. And this is a Victorian property, the old ones were set in the wall, and so it seems only sensible to continue a method that served this house well for hundreds of years. After experimenting with hammer and chisel, I found the most effective way was to fit a 16mm drill bit on my SDS drill, marking on it with duct tape how far in I could drill, because with just two brick courses I didn't want to drill through to outside. And this was enormously effective at pretty much single-handedly excavating all the cavities for the new joist. I'd ordered 10 one meter length threaded bars or rods and cut these into 200mm lengths using this metal cutting disc on my grinder. I experimented with a universal diamond disc but it wasn't nearly as effective as that other one. I then sanded the ends of each using my belt sander to remove the burrs so each nut could be easily screwed on. Then I slid the existing joist out of the way so I could remove joist number one to get the two sister joists cut for it and drilled through all three in a zigzag pattern top and bottom at 600 mil centers. The structural engineer said that was fine. And after struggling with a slightly blunt paddle bit, I bought this 13 millimeter auger bit from I think Amazon and it's been absolutely brilliant. I thought I'd lift each joist into place one by one and then bolt them together in situ, but this turned out to be a massive pain. So for the remainder, I cut them, lined them up and bolted them together on the floor and then lifted this rather heavy structure back into place in one. It's 
gluing the whole lot over to the side each time to make space for the next one. I then realised to get the joist level I'd need to take a piece off the top. Again I cut the first one in situ which was difficult, so after a bit of experimenting I found the best technique was to use my circular saw for the majority of the cut, finishing it off with a jigsaw. I couldn't use a jigsaw for the whole cut as it wanders too much. I don't own any acros yet, so to jack each joist against the floor above I wedged a piece of timber under it and hammered it tight to enable me to set the joist to the right height and place a wedge underneath. And that line of central noggins is also now fixed in place. I had to notch these to fit over the window lintel. Everything that's been notched or cut I've coated with a bitumastic um, Bostic bituminous paint. The joists in any vent are tantalised. I was considering whether I could leave these gaps open to give a bit of ventilation to prevent any moisture getting into the joist. But I think from building regs point of view you have to completely fill these up to prevent any air leakage. Any builders or carpenters out there, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on this in the comments section below the vid. With the ceiling now properly strengthened it was time to sort out the floor of my daughter's bedroom, which we'd managed to keep in place when we ripped out the original substructure. We'd ripped out the joist, ground off the nails so the entire floor was sitting loose on the new joist. I had standard and stained this a year ago so it didn't actually look so bad with the floor now strengthened but the 1970s boards were in a bit of a mess with lots unsupported and splintering. As you'd expect it pulled up pretty easily although I, to help with this I removed some skirting boards as well. Partly as the height of some will need adjusting as the old floor wasn't level in places, luckily these were only screwed in place without glue. I knew this as I'd installed them myself several years ago. So it was just a question of locating the screws with a magnet, I'll put a link in the description, and then chiselling and bradawling out the two part wood filler to get to the screw. There was one tricky bit to remove from under the insulated plasterboard wall I'd installed a few years back. And to get this out I actually lowered the floor by taking those wedges out from underneath the joist. I ordered some 220mm wide engineered oak flooring from JFJ Wood Flooring, a company I'd previously used for the bathroom and our bedroom floor. It's quite echo in here isn't it? 22mm thick comprising a 6mm strip of oak on top and a 10 layer multi laminate hardwood ply undercore, it has the strength to sit on joists without additional protection. And given its thickness, how it's constructed and the fact that it's tongue and grooved all the way around, you don't need to use noggins where the floorboards end between joists. Or indeed a sub base in spite of what one carpenter was trying to tell me quite aggressively on Facebook this week. More fool me, a mere DIYer, for daring to stand up to a time served carpenter. I've always used tongue tight screws to fix this flooring down as they are completely hidden and whilst I've experimented with glue guns in the past the open time of the glue is too short to clamp the floorboards in place so I settled on egg or adhesive this time which slowly expands and hardens to create a really strong bond. Why do I use glue as well? Well because I didn't on the bathroom floor and it does creak a bit now underfoot. On clamping the floorboards in position again I've used various techniques in the past from my old fashioned wedge clamp through to these Irwin quick clamps but the best method is definitely these ratchet tie down straps which you can pick up for under £7 each. I bought mine from Toolstation through the WeShop app where you get shares for each purchase. There's a link to this in the description below the video. As my floorboards go under the wall so I can't get the straps over the end of them I did have to create these strap braces which I screwed to the floor where the screw holes will be hidden by the skirting boards. I've got five across the room so I can easily hook one of my two strap clamps to the relevant one depending on which floorboard I'm clamping. There were a couple of architraves to trim back with my multi-tool, the floorboards under an old doorway and some slate to pack under the steel that my builders hadn't been able to get to. Not to mention some brickwork to make good on both sides of the chimney with PVA going down here so I could glue glazing packers to the brickwork to pack under the floorboards. You have to get a bit creative with the final few pieces which I slotted into place by taking off the underside of the groove as otherwise they wouldn't have slotted into the tongue. I've also fixed in a few vis visible screws to secure the floorboard in place whilst the glue was setting and I filled these with some dark oak coloured two part filler and sanded them in preparation for staining. One quick word of caution, if you're going to stain your floor like I have and you need to sand it either for that reason or because you've got a few scratches and blemishes, make sure you use a sandpaper which is at least rougher than the surface that you're staining. Because on my last floor I got into a real mess when I sanded away all those blemishes with 180 grit sandpaper, it was finer than the floor and so when I stained it, the stain didn't take to those sanded areas as well and I had a complete nightmare patchwork that had to be completely sanded and started again. Which brings us neatly onto the final stage of this flooring project, staining and sealing. 
This is the third room I've done and in each of these we've been trying to match the only period feature we've got left in this cottage, the hall, now temporary kitchen floor. I swear by tree text which I've used each time. They have a range of different colours and I mix two thirds antique oak with one third ebony to get this authentic aged look from my new floor. I roller it on with a simulated mohair mini roller and the important thing with this stuff is to wipe away the residue once you've applied it, otherwise it won't dry properly and might end up streaky. I've done a full video on this, a link to which is coming up on screen now, but I've basically found over the years toilet roll to be the best thing to use to wipe off the excess and keep a bin bag with you to put the used tissue in as you progress across the floor. Oh and don't forget those night trial gloves. A day later and I applied the first of two coats of clear matte hard wax oil. Again there are loads of different finishes from flat matte through to satin and gloss. I used a short pile mohair roller again, but this time no need to remove it. Instead, I left it 24 hours to dry and then decided to give it a very light sand. I wasn't sure I could be bothered to do this, but I'm so glad I have because it's just a little rough to the touch. A little 600 grit sandpaper, very right lightly across the surface and it's suddenly beautiful and smooth. That's literally all you need to do. And the whole thing will probably take about seven or eight minutes. One final coat of oil and the floor was finally finished. Now what's quite interesting is after years of buying this stuff, I finally got to speak to them direct recently. They're not paying me anything to talk to about them in today's video, but what they have done is offered you a 7.5% discount if you buy any of the TreeTech stuff directly through their website. There'll be links in the description below this video and you need to apply the code CDIY7.5 to qualify for that discount. All that remains for me to do is fix back on those skirting boards and although I've got all the screw holes to fill again, I decided to prime with zins a bin and top coat them before attaching to the wall as it'll be much less fiddly to finish the painting if I haven't got to paint near the floorboards. Now a kitchen update like this wouldn't be complete without an update on my internal wall insulation. In my last video I explained I'll be going down a non-breathable route with PIR board. Um, the point being that a lime based plaster wall system wouldn't cut it in a house like this which I'm trying to keep warm. But when I was going through the comments I came across this one from Iron Imp 1. He pointed out there are breathable wall products that would keep the restorationist happy. Now he was of course right about this and I'd panned the breathable wall insulation options without properly researching them. So I decided that I owed it to myself, to my property, and that because there's a little bit of damp below the injection damp proof course, which is below the ground level outside. But I also owed it to you lot to properly research this area. So after a lot of phone calls and research, I've decided to go for a breathable system which incorporates insulated studs to eliminate thermal bridging and insulated slabs together with an intelligent vapour control layer. I'll explain this in much greater detail once I've finally got this space built out and I can start thinking about applying the internal wall insulation. So that's it for today. Fingers crossed I get the planning permission soon, but there will be lots of other video updates in the meantime, so keep your eye out for those. As usual, everything I've referred to today will be in the description below the video, which of course you can access on your smartphone by clicking on the more link and on your PC by clicking on the show more button. So thanks again for watching today's video. And one last thing, if you're new to my channel, it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here and don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. See you soon.